of uh, spatial resolution. Okay, this is this is very uh, strong uh, statement, which you cannot uh, have. Uh, you cannot resolve two point sources. Okay, which are smaller than this number here. It's uh, 6.1 lambda over the NA. Is this is the optical aperture of your objective lens. It's uh, the sin alpha here. Alpha is the aperture angle. Okay. If you open more and more and more, you squeeze this thing, but you cannot go beyond something around half lambda. And we talk about uh, electron microscopy uh, resolution a lot here uh, during these days. I would like to, to, to talk a little bit about optical resolution. And we also have this, uh, th these two things are correlated. Uh, and this, this is something about the coherence uh, theory okay, of uh, 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 lambation sources. But uh, this, this is for uh, coherence of uh, radiation fields. And these statements say that the fields are uncorrelated over distance la larger than uh, half lambda. So I will talk about this uh, here and show you that we can go beyond these limits if you do near field optics, and I will explain why. OK, so I will give a quick introduction here. What, why we do near field optics, OK? And uh, first, let's, let's see where the AB principle comes from, OK? Here's the thing. This is this is uh, a source, okay, a plane source. We have a light source here, this uh, red thing here, and uh, what I'm looking here is how the electric field of the radiation emitted by a plane s a source in z equals zero, okay, uh, propagates along some distance uh, direction here z, okay. So you have a light source and uh, the, the radiation is propagating, and uh, I want to, s to analyze this along some direction here, okay? And uh, this, is, this is how we uh, describe, okay, the evolution of this optical uh, radiation field at, at the plane Z here, okay? And we, we can describe this as the Fourier components as, as the integral of the Fourier components okay of the optical field at the plane Z equals zero here at the source so this is the Fourier uh, components uh, of the field at the source okay and we have this propagation here okay like a plane wave so the point is uh, the near field optics is, is associated to how these uh, k vectors of light, okay, the, the spectrum of k vectors of light, because if you if you look at the 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 the, the this is the wave number of light, okay, which is basically given by two pi over lambda. This is the k of light, okay. So you have light with some uh, wavelength lambda. And the wave vector, the modulus, okay, the norm of this wave vector is uh, two pi over lambda. And you have all the components, okay, of your spectrum of wave vectors because this light is going everywhere, okay. And uh, uh, you can decompose this in, in different uh, wave vectors, but here we are looking at the z direction. So le let's look at the z, k z component okay we just say that the square of the kz component is is k square minus 2 pi over lambda square okay and the, the point is we can have this is a, a complex number you can have the real part and the imaginary part okay here's the thing if the the kz component okay uh, if you take the spectrum of uh, in-plane components, okay, and this is spectrum, the, the, the sum of the square of this uh, in-plane components, it is smaller than the, the square of the wave vector of light, the, 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 the k square, okay? It means you are here, 
and this we call the homogeneous okay, part of the radiation field. Okay. You see that Kz is a real number, okay? And then if if this is a real number, okay, I, I will just I just go to this part uh, in a while. But le let's do the opposite. If this guy is here, the 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 sum of the square of the the in-plane components it's larger than the wave vector of light, the Kz will be imaginary. Okay, so the 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 z components of the of the spatial frequency of light will be imaginary, and uh, as a consequence, okay, we have the homogeneous part and we have the evanescent part of the radiation field because, in the case that they are real, the the the, the wave vector is is uh, the the kz component is real, okay. This is just a wave plane, uh, a plane wave uh, propagating field. But if this wave vector is imaginary, okay, here, if this guy here is imaginary, i times i, you have a negative signal here, and this exponential is just a, a, a decay, a real exponential decay. And uh, this is what we call the evanescent part of the field. So, in summary, okay, what we have is you have a spectrum of components of wave vectors, okay, of light in plane, okay, and uh, for some part of these wave vectors, okay, the the k component will be just like the the z component will be just real, and this this is the part of the field that just propagates, okay. But if you go for high frequency here for the kx and ky, so if you get these high frequency components, okay, in plane, so the kz component becomes imaginary. So this is the part of the field that just doesn't propagate. It, it, it becomes evanescent, okay? And then it just it sticks at the source. And this is a problem because you have a lot of information. So all this spectrum, this spatial uh, frequencies here, doesn't propagate, so you lose information. Okay, you don't lose any uh, uh, any type of information. You lose the high part, the, the the high frequency information. So you see that we are limited to a 2 pi over lambda, because this is what you limitate your homogeneous part. And if you limitate this in the real, uh, uh, in the reciprocal space, because here we are dealing with the spatial frequencies, okay? In the real space, you are limited to lambda over 2 pi. So this is a problem for optical resolution, because you cannot squeeze the fields, okay, more than this, or you cannot image a, a, a probe, a, a, a point source, okay, in a size smaller than this. I, why? Because you are losing all this information here for the high frequency components. So they just don't propagate. Then your image becomes blurred, okay? You don't see it. You cannot reconstruct your source because you don't have all the information. So all these K vectors, they just don't propagate, okay? So the point is, because we are far from the, f from the source, okay? We have these components that evanesce. Then we have this problem, which is the diffraction limit, okay? This is basically diffraction. And uh, the point is, we cannot uh, squeeze any type of focus, okay? For more than, than something like this. So we are limited to half lambda, more or less. We are limited actually by, physically, we are limited for lambda over two pi, but you know, this, this is, uh, if, you, if you get a real microscopy uh, system, okay? You have all the numerical aperture and so on, and then you go something around lambda, half lambda, okay? So what's the trick here? Wha what's the near field optics? We see that we cannot reconstruct your 
source because we are losing information. Some, some part of the, the, the spatial frequency, the spectrum of spatial frequency just don't propagate. So we have to fish them. Okay, we have to fish them, and we use this. We use op antennas to do that. Okay, so basically, what we do is we have an op antenna very close to the source, and this op antenna takes the information from the near field and send to the far field. This is a channel. So it's basically a high frequency channel. Okay, so we are losing all this high frequency in spatial spectrum, okay? And then this small object here will fish this information and send to the far field. So we can squeeze the optical resolution, okay? Something like, for example, this is a carbon nanotube, okay? And this is like a 20 nanometers because the size of this o small optical antenna here is 20 nanometers, so, so we can squeeze this a lot. For example, this, this that image is, is here, okay? This is a uh, scanning of a Raman band of a carbon nanotube, okay? This is the shape of the laser focus, okay? This is the diffraction limit. As I told you, we cannot go, we cannot squeeze this because it just doesn't propagate, so you lose the information at the source. Then what we do, we put a near field probe here, which is basically a metal, a very tiny and uh, thin metal structure, okay? And this metal structure takes these evanescent components and send to the far field. Then the optical resolution becomes the resolution, the size of your probe, okay? And this is why we use near field optics, okay? And uh, the most important part is the optical antenna. And the optical antenna, what it does is basically to transfer information from the near field to the far field and vice versa. Sure. So um, in the usual theory of radiation that we learn in Jackson, for instance, you have all this uh, in your propagation, you have sources and they're emitting light, and you have the far field and the near field. You, you're talking about the near field, you will be talking about the near field, but there usually we never make an argument in terms of the frequency because it's not really a plane wave. You know, it's just like you have the charges, and so the reason why you don't reach the far field in the usual way to look at it is because the fields drop fast more than one over e squared, mm -hmm. and you know, when you calculate the point vector, the pointing vector, it, it is just to get zero when, when you're in the far field, as opposed to the, the near field. So I don't recall at least the you know, any exponential factor in the wave vector. So uh, wh what am I missing here in your argument? Because you mentioned the frequency. You see, it's clearly not omega. It's not no, no, KC, it's not, right? no, it's a spatial frequency. It's, it's not omega. It's not omega, it's not the time frequency. So you're talking about the KZ part only. Yeah, it's just the K part, it's the, uh, it's the spatial frequency part. What does the R, one of our argument enter here? Because that's the usual argument, that, you know, the pointing Sorry. vector goes, you know, to zero. The fall off of no, the field. No, it, it, it doesn't go to zero because you have the homogeneous part. So you have the propagating part and the non-propagating part. Yeah, but my question, I don't know, I understood it there. It's the, the usual theory is, you know, it's the drop faster than one over R squared that kills the field. Ah, okay. Not the exponential. So that I'm trying to understand what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, so, so because this is a two, two different things. One is, I think, is a matter of uh, just cross-section, okay? Because it just your sphere just goes... Yeah, okay? that, that's right. So you just propagate and then you integrate over yeah, some area? Yeah, this is a density, the energy density. Right. But it means that if you could integrate over the whole space, you still get your signal. Well, if you're in the far field, you don't get... You only get the far field. You only you get, get the, the far field, field. exactly. But it propagates. It doesn't matter how distant you are. 
if, if you integrate over the whole sphere, you still get the, the, the thing. This part here doesn't propagate. Yeah, but there, it, there it propagates, but you don't get it to the infinity. So that you'd have to take a tip and no. get it very close to the sample. Then you see it. That's the then usual near field. Yeah. Because it's, um, it's evanescent, really not in this sense. That's why I'm finding it strange. It's evanescent in the sense that it falls off falls quickly off. Yeah. with 1 over r squared or really 1 over quick. r cube. Yeah, it's something like 10 nanometers or 20 nanometers. You don't see it anymore. All right. OK. OK, so the, the most important part here is the optical antennas. Uh, and uh, here, we, we used to, to make this. Uh, uh, we, we, we made a lot of progress with the optical antennas, OK? First, we take like, a, you know, the, the localized surface plasma resonance. It depends strongly on the size of the particle, OK? So you have to tune with the wavelength of light, and we work uh, to make like some cuttings in the near field probes to, to tune these localized uh, surface plasma resonances. And at uh, first, what we did, we took like etched gold tips, okay? We cut with the uh, uh, electron beam, okay? And we were able to, to measure, uh, as Juan showed here in the eels, we can probe plasmons, okay? And we, we were able to make localized surface plasmas in this uh, in these probes, and we were able to tune them with the wavelength of, of light that we are using. Uh, this uh, system is uh, we have a patent that is now uh, protecting U.S. and uh, in going to be protecting like China and uh, Europe, and it works very well. We have a high uh, resolution image here of a uh, Roman uh, band of graphene. And we also, uh, I'm not going into details here because I want to go to the physics of the 2D material, but uh, we also work to make these uh, two steps pyramid tips, okay? We call it plasma tunable tip pyramid, which we, we also have this uh, small tip here, and uh, the length of this small, this tiny pyramid here, okay? is tuned to the wavelength of light. This is realized. Uh, uh, the, the, the real thing is, is here. And there is some steps of uh, lithography in silicon. Okay, we do silicon etching. We stop the, 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 the process, and then we start again, and we do this negative thing, and we fish, we cover with gold, make a, uh, some gold sputtering or, or the position, and we fish these tips, and uh, it's interesting because uh, when we start to to look at the at the plasmons of uh, generated by these tips, we saw that this is not a half lambda antenna but a quarter lambda antenna, which is kind of weird. Okay, uh, and the the point is that this is a monopole antenna, which is also something that sounds like a beast, okay? You have a monopole antenna. But uh, the point is, if you ground, uh, this, this is not really new, if you, if you take something, uh, uh, an optical antenna, and you ground it, okay? It becomes a monopole antenna because the image is the other pole, okay? So uh, this, uh, as you see, this structure here is grounded to a plateau. Here's more. So here's the small tip. Everything here is gold, okay? So this small tip is grounded to this plateau, so it becomes a monopole because the other pole is the reflection, is the image because of the plateau. So we have, we can have dipole antennas with that, that one that I showed before, the, the, with the cut, okay? And then we have these small pyramids with the monopole antennas, and uh, we have uh, our instrumentation there. We, we do the, the, the test setup. It's a homemade setup. Uh, if, if you are interested on this, I, I can give you details later. 
and we we what we have to do is to put this small near field probe inside of the focus area, okay, and we do the measurements with a high uh, resolution, okay. This is the testing of the spatial uh, confinement that we get there is like something around 10 nanometers, uh, and this it, it came out that these probes are really good. They are really really good. Uh, this is like that. This is a, a measurement that we do. is is what we call the approach curve. I will talk about the approach curves more. This is the tip sample distance separation. Okay. Uh, and uh, here's the thing: if you thi this is a spectrum taken taken without the tip. This is the Raman spectrum of graphene. And if you approach the tip, okay, the spectrum goes up a lot because you increase so much the, the 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 radiation field close to the to the to the sample okay the signal goes up a lot so this is what we call the approach curve this is the distance between the tip and the sample and for usual tips you go for graphene you go up like something twice and with these tips we go like 10 times and uh, actually this this is uh, much more now we have something going like 50 times so it, it's a lot of enhancement okay i have 9 minutes and i i really want to reach the point here to deliver this uh, new physics here we are talking about raman scattering here so we do near field scattering for raman which we call TERS, which is the tip enhanced RUM spectrum. Okay? And then uh, the RUM is scattering. Uh, this is a, a very simple way to look at the Raman. Okay? This is an uh, incident field with frequency, with frequency omega. Okay? And uh, this is the scattered field with frequency omega s. For Raman scattering, the, the, the scattered field has a different time frequency as the incident field, okay? And uh, here's the thing, the, this is a, a description, okay? This is a linear response description of uh, 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 the Raman scattering. You have the incident field, okay? You have the, the susceptibility, okay, of your material, and this is basically the Raman dipole, okay? that you generate here. This is the Raman susceptibility, okay? So you generate the Raman dipole, and then we have the green function from the source to the detector, okay? So this is the, the Raman dipole here. So we have, the again, the incident field, the susceptibility, which is the Raman polarizability, and then this becomes the Raman dipole, and this dipole we will meet the 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 at the frequency omega s okay and this is the green function that describe the 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 propagation from the source to the to the detector okay the Raman intensity is the ins the ensemble average that we measure at the detector okay and then for usual grew uh, uh, books for the uh, for Raman if you look at the books okay they describe the Rama as an incoherent event, okay? There's no coherence between anything that happens at the sample domain, okay? You just make this as a square, uh, modulus the square of, the, of, the, of this product here, okay? Uh, and uh, you integrate this over this the, the sample domain, so you have the volume of the sample and you have this shape here and everything is, is incoherent. But you know, this is, this is uh, the usual thing that you get uh, in the early days, okay, for Rami scattering, because this, this is kind of right, because you are very far from the source, okay, and the fields are uncorrelated. As I told you at the beginning, okay, it's for the, the early coherence uh, theory, okay, the fields are just uncorrelated. You cannot see correlations more than lambda. Okay, but here's the thing. If we look at this 
integral here, and we have to do the ensemble average, okay? And we have two different dipoles, Raman dipoles in your sample, okay? You have to be careful because, because if you go close to the source, you can start to see correlations. So things are not really uncorrelated, okay? Basically, long story short, if you have a gas, like in the early Raman theory, where people start to measure gases, land liquids, and so on, what's the correlation between a molecule vibrating here or a molecule vibrate, vi vibrating here? They are just considered to be uncorrelated, okay? But if you now take your detector and go really close to your sample, okay, and you, you measure, for example, to the crystal, where you have a phonon here, and you have uh, uh, something vibrating here, and you have something vibrating here, and if these things are correlated, okay, you can have interference. And then you cannot just integrate over your source as if things are uncorrelated. Basically, we assume, okay, that the response material, the, 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 the response of your material, which is the Roman polarizability, they are correlated. Basically, what we are saying is that, okay, there is some correlation, okay, length of the funnel, where the things will be uh, in phase. If we do this, okay, if we say that there's no correlation, okay, if we say, okay, this is uncorrelated, this is just a, a direct delta, this function here is just a direct delta, you go to the usual solution. But if you assume, okay, that things should be somehow, uh, this is just uncorrelated source, or you can go to the full coherence source, or we can do something in between, okay? Which is, we, we did this before, actually. We say, okay, now we are so close that we are fully coherent, but this is also uh, inaccurate. And uh, the point here is, these are different Rama modes, okay? I'm not going to details, but for example, this is the stretching mode, and this is the totally symmetric mode. And uh, you see, let's do the, the, the analysis here. This is, the, this, this is interesting. You have your near field probe here, okay? And uh, this near field probe will illuminate your sample. So this, this is what we call the tip illuminating the sample. So you shine light at the tip, you excite those surface localized surface plasmas, okay, and the tip will illuminate your sample in the near field, okay? So this is a dipole type of emitter, okay, and you have the field like propagating to, to your sample, something like this, okay? So it goes here, it comes here, comes here and here. So you illuminate your sample in, s in this way, okay? Now you have the Raman process going on, okay? For the totally symmetric, okay, the field is scattering the same way. So it doesn't change the polarization. So the field goes back to the sample, to the tip, okay? Same way, same polarization. But if you have this stretching mode, it changed the, 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 the polarization of the scattered field is not the same polarization as the incident field. So either you have this situation or you have this situation. And you see that, for example, the X part goes back to the tip like this, and the Y part comes like this. So they have uh, destructive interference. So you can have constructive interference and you, ha you can have destructive in interference. So then it is possible, okay, to see coherence of vibrations, okay, if you go really close to the source. If you go to the far field, you just lose this information, okay? This is like the old Emil Wolf books. You don't see any type of correlation smaller than lambda, okay? For the same reason that we cannot get spatial resolution, is smaller than uh, half lambda, but here we can you we can have these differences, and uh, I, I cannot go 
too much in detail, but I will show you that indeed, okay, for this, this is, this is again the, the, the tip sample separation, okay? This is a very important uh, experiment, which if we probe how the tip goes down, okay, and how the signal enhances, okay, we see that those modes that have constructive interference, they, they enhance more than the mode that have destructive interference. And we found, okay, some relation which depending on how much they, how different is the enhancement, okay, we can measure something, okay, we can, uh, what's the name in English? So, we can extract, okay, from these different enhancements, the spatial correlation of the optical phonons in the material. Okay, so for example, for graphene, we extract something like 30 nanometers. Okay, and this is related to the question that I I made to Lucas uh, at in the the first day. Uh, so the Einstein model, okay, say okay, the everything is sun correlated. Then you go to the full correlation uh, picture, but we assume here that we have a Gaussian correlation, okay? And we extract numbers around 30 nanometers, and this may be important for transport uh, uh, in, in thermal transport in these uh, uh, materials. We also measure the gallium arsenide, uh, gallium sulfur, okay? So this GAS. Uh, material here, and we also saw some different modes with different uh, interference, and we extract something larger, something around 60 nanometers for this material for coherence length of optical forms. So we are just starting to scratch this because this is the all the information is in the near field, okay? And uh, we need like to uh, it's more like we need more technology to 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 keep doing this type of uh, measurements to to understand why the the real meaning of these numbers okay and the consequence and where they come from we we are not sure yet but we know that we have different uh, type of interference for different modes because it's just geometry okay we lose this information in the far field because this the, the field the correlation just goes away okay to see these correlations we have to go really close Okay, and now we have these numbers, and uh, we hope that some different information can, can be extracted from here. So this is the end of my presentation, and uh, now thank you. <laughs> we have time for a few questions.